In the fight against corruption, it has been demonstrated throughout the world that un unless you sustain the war, and it is a war, yeah. remember that there are individuals, not only in Nigeria, but throughout the world, yeah. who suckle from the breasts of corruption. And they are not just about to win themselves off the suckling. They must be forced out of it, and they'll fight, fight back. Because there are individuals, even in government, in all sectors of government, who now take their children to school on the basis of money corruptly acquired. They live in houses that are corruptly acquired. They do everything on the basis of things that are acquired through corruption. So when you want to stop it, they are going to kill you. They are going to ensure that you are neutralized. These are the people that you are fighting against because these are individuals whose conscience is dead and they are going to do anything on earth to prevent you. In fact, when one chooses to fight corruption, one must remember that he or she can be eliminated at all times. And what President Buhari and indeed any other president in the world must do is to recruit the population. If the population has been wedded to the idea that corruption is a bad thing, then that is the beginning of the success of that battle. When I see, for example, your former Minister for Petroleum being uh, investigated in the United Kingdom without being a sadist, I'm very happy. Because if you look at the wealth that he's alleged to have accumulated, that is unexplained wealth. Even if he lived for a thousand, she lived for a thousand years, she would never make that kind of money. James Seabury, who was prosecuted, convicted, and served sentence in the United Kingdom. What lacks in Africa is punishment. Impunity is alive and well in Africa. And we, the electorate, as I say, times without number, are in the business of celebrating thieves. We must stop. Yesterday, uh, Barista Farana said it very well, that we camouflage theft by giving them nice English names, money laundering, fraud, embezzlement, and all those veneers that make them look as if it is some kind of nice game. Let us call these men and women by the right name. They are thieves, stealing on an industrial scale. They are murderers. And once we begin to call them like that, and they have a mark of cane upon their forehead, and we shun them, has it been done in African countries? Yes, it has been done. And I keep on repeating in countries such as Tanzania, they are being dealt with. In Rwanda, they are being dealt with. In Mauritius, they are being dealt with. In Botswana, they are being dealt with. Once you begin to deal with them, then the others who may want to behave like them will begin to take the cue. We must, in the nature of things, earn what we earn through the sweat of our brow. That is the only way in which Africa will realize their potential. Many of these individuals who are in positions of leadership in Africa don't want to leave because they are thieves. And they are scared. They are scared that if they left office, they would be prosecuted. And my view is that they should be prosecuted. You know, individuals such as Hissen Habre, who we know what he did, was it in Chad? A good example to the leadership that impunity will not thrive. Because I've been talking to a friend of mine from the Cameroons who tells me what is happening in their country right now. And other African countries are blind to it. He doesn't even occupy the headlines of the neighboring newspapers, of the, the country's neighbor, uh, neighbor's uh, newspapers. Yet the Cameroons now should be in the same position as we see the conflict in Catalan in Spain. Yet we are attacking it in page 13 in newspapers in Nigeria, in Liberia, and other countries. The time has come that Africa must learn and realize that the world is not bothered about Africa. The world is only bothered about Africa when they want to take the resources of Africa. Then they bother. They want oil, they bother. And I'm using the word bother in a very deliberate fashion, not in the traditional orthodox fashion. They bother when they want to take our timber. They bother when they want to take our bauxite, when they want to take our cocoa, when they want to take our uranium. But they don't bother about us. 
They, are, they come to a continent without disrespecting the elephant and they want to preserve the elephant so that they can come and watch the elephant, but they don't care if a hundred uh, Africans die. They want to preserve our monkeys. They want to preserve our leopards and our other animals, but they don't care about us. To them, Africa is a zoo of sorts. And until the day that we Africans realize that we are on our own, we are going nowhere. And very soon they are going to shut us out if they have not shut us out already. We will not go to the United States of America, we will not go to Europe, and I'm happy that we are being forced to stay in Africa. Let us stay in Africa and build Africa. I mean, what does Africa lack in terms of resources? What, what do we lack? If it is solar energy, which continent is capable of producing solar energy to light this continent and the entire earth? If it is hydroelectricity, what can we not generate? If it is minerals, if we wanted to make bombs, if we should, where do they get their uranium from? If it is timber, what don't we have? If it is human resources, we are two billion of us. And we are people who have intelligence. And yet we are kept in a constant state of conflict. The Europeans, the French persuading their former colonies that they are more French than they are Yoruba. They are more French than they are Wolofs and Mandinkas. The British persuading us that we are more British than we are Ibibi or Yoruba. And of course, when we find ourselves in that schizophrenic state, then we engage in internal conflict and they sell their arms to us. Tell me, which African country makes guns? None. I think Africans must recognize that bad governance is harmful to their very well-being, not only for the current generation, but generations yet to be born. This is a continent that has always had potential. These are a people that have, have, have always had potential. But since we regained our independence from the colonialists, African leaders in many countries have consistently demonstrated that they are not working in the interest of their people. And that is sad because many of the individuals who occupied positions of leadership are still beholden to the colonial masters. We see former French uh, colonized nations, leaders who are beholden to Paris, those who are colonized by Portugal, beholden to Lisbon, those who are colonized by Belgium, beholden to Brussels, those colonized by the United Kingdom, beholden to London, and the single country that was colonized by Spain, uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, beholden uh, to Madrid. And this is tragic. Of course, currently, many African leaders are getting beholden to Beijing and progressively the United States of America in Washington. The net effect is that the African agenda is being sacrificed to the detriment of the peoples. And we have examples which are live as I speak. The problems in the Cameroon, the problems in Togo, the problems in South Sudan, the problem in Central African Republic, in Mali, in Mauritania. And these are sad things. And the tragic thing is that the African Union appears to be helpless in this situation. Africa has been victimized by systems of government which we do not understand and which are not serving as well. And the time is now to wake up and to begin to find African solutions to African problems. Is it doable? Yes, it is. But we must wake up from our slumber because those who are in positions of leadership are quite comfortable with the situation as it is. We must some have something in the nature of an Arab Spring. The Arab streets woke up. And they told their leaders, you are going to do that which is in our best interest. Unfortunately, some of the gains made after the Arab Spring have been clawed back. And that is a lesson for us, that if you 
regain your independence, you must remain eternally vigilant because, it's, because the forces of reaction are very persistent. <laughs> you know what is amazing about the African Union, which is the immediate success of the OAU, is that it's beginning to let Africa down. I, I was amazed about a month ago when Zimbabwean president, whom I respected in his early days as a freedom fighter and as a man of vision and intellect, when he went to the African Union and made a donation of one million dollars, and the African Union accepted it, in a situation where the people in Zimbabwe are suffering, where there is almost 80 to 90 percent unemployment. And the reason why the African Union has become, as you rightly say, a toothless bulldog is because there are no leaders who are true crusaders for the agenda of the African Union in the manner that we had in the early days when we had Nkrumah, when we had Nyerere, when we had Hail Silasi when we had Gamal Abdel Nasser. Today, in a very perverted concept of non-interference in the affairs of other nations and in a perverted understanding of the idea of sovereignty, people are not their brothers and sisters keepers so that we know that there is a festering wound in South Sudan and we are doing nothing about it. We know there is a festering wound in the Cameroons, and we are doing nothing about it. A festering wound in Togo, and we are doing nothing about it. And even when the leaders congregate in Addis Ababa for their annual jamboree, they don't discuss these problems. Right now, I would have thought that there should be an extraordinary session of the African Union to discuss a number of things, to discuss the countries which are in trouble, and I'm mentioning them ad nauseum, to ask the question, what is the problem in the Central African Republic? How can it be resolved? How, what is the problem in, uh, in, uh, the Tog in Togo, in Gambia, in the Cameroons, and in many other countries, so that we have African solutions to African problems? Because what we'll see very shortly is that the UN will sit down and send a peacekeeping force. And when there is no peace to be kept, and they send peacekeeping forces when, in a manner of speaking, the horse will have bolted away. So the African Union is very disappointing. When Dr. Mohammed was appointed as the chairman of the commission, I thought that this was a new person that would come with new energy to replace Nkosan and Lamini Zuma. But what I see is lethargy. What I see is lack of enthusiasm. What I see is lack of direction. What I see is continued pain. I was amazed about a month ago, if I'm not wrong, when the international community asked the African Union to nominate a country to sit in the Security Council, and they nominated the Democratic Republic of Congo. How can you possibly nominate the Democratic Republic of Congo, whose president has refused to hold the election, whose country is generating refugees, whose government is controlling Kinshasa only in real terms, and where there is conflict everywhere, and where the resources are being taken away by the Chinese, the Malaysians, and the Belgians, and other rogue individuals from Europe and America, and you nominate such a person? You nominate Aina to sit in an assembly which is judging how goats should be preserved? It is a tragedy of gigantic proportion. And we consistently do this in Africa and we think is normal. Africa has now normalized the absurd and we think that sense is what we do. Yet it is nonsense. And unfortunately, many of us who are not in positions of influence, our younger generation particularly, think that this does not matter. This matters. If you look at the history of revolutions, it was always the young people. As early as 1980, uh, 1908 in Turkey, it is the young people who came up to rise up against the dictatorial regime. We remember even during the Bolshevik Revolution, it was the young people. We remember during the civil rights movement 
led by Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy, among others. It was young people. In 1968 in France, when there was a problem, initially in 1958 and 1968, it was young people. We remember in Tiananmen Square, it was young people. We remember in Korea in 1980, it was the young people. In South Africa, in the Sharpeville Massacre in 1969, it was the young people. In Soweto in 1976, it was the young people. In the Arab world, it's the young people. But our young people in Africa today are imprisoned by Arsenal and Manchester United and Barcelona and Real Madrid and our young girls are imprisoned by cheap South American soap operas and Beyonce Knowles. How can that be? How can a continent be so accursed that our young people have no sense of her history, no sense of her presence, no sense of her future? No wonder the Chinese are conquering us by the day. And we are wondering. John F. Kennedy said in 1960, a society whose young men and women are in a constant state of slumber will never realize our potential. Our young people must wake up. It is only the day that they wake up that they will be able to send a clear message to those in positions of leadership that you cannot continue to misgovern us. I look forward to those days. I have mentioned President Mahmoud Buhari fondly in a number of forums, but remember that uh, President Mahmoud Buhari came into office and has been unwell. And therefore, he is not performing at full throttle because of sickness. And you must remember that when the captain is unwell, even if there is another captain who replaces him, the ship does not move with the steadiness that it deserves. Remember that the president of Niger the, the United Republic of the Federal Republic of Nigeria inherited a system that was rotten to the core. Rotten because of corruption. In fact, he campaigned and won the elections on the promise that he would fight misgovernance and corruption. And I have no doubt in my mind that those who are corrupt, when he is away and unwell in the United Kingdom, they celebrate, say, this is our turn. They fight back so that there is a sense in which he needs support. And it's not lost on me that his vice president, Osin Banjo, has tried to support. But when you are in an acting capacity, there is a limit beyond which you cannot go, lest your president think that you are beginning to undermine him. I wish your president Godspeed in recovery and also that he institutionalizes and ensures that his agenda is bought by the others. There must be a buy-in. If you look at uh, the whole concept of religion, even if you want to give it a spiritual dimension, in the Christian religion, Christ had a message from heaven, but he sold it to 12 others. And there was a buy-in, and that buy-in is what has seen Christianity spread over a period of 2,000 years. The Prophet Muhammad had an agenda. He said he went to the mountains and he was told, Ikra, read, and he read and came back with the agenda, and he sold it. He tried to sell it in Mecca, it didn't sell very well. He went to Medina, sold it to his Swahabas, and ultimately Islam spread. In other words, what I'm trying to say that throughout the ages, no matter how good your idea is, that idea must be sold to others, they must buy into it, and that is how you institutionalize the idea. You cannot be a lone warrior in this matter, because the children of darkness hunt like a pack of wolves, and they will devour you if you are alone.